This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to the holiday episode of Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. Okay, I have a confession. I was sent so many amazing creepy Christmas stories by my friend Jenny that there will be two holiday episodes this year. Next week's, which will be out on Christmas Eve, is an incredible old Irish ghost story set during a raucous Christmas party when a mysterious stranger shows up. From there, it gets very scary. Seriously, the climax still gives me chills just thinking about it. It was written in the 1800s. It's very snowy, very atmospheric. It's going to be a great one to pop on to settle in on a cozy night. This week, I have both old and new and long and short for you. It's a whole dark, gory, spooky holiday bonanza. Before we get started, remember to check those show notes for trigger warnings. Now, first up was sent in by listener Griffin Bradford. Thank you so much, Griffin, for your story, The Little Drummer Boy. not fast, agonizingly slow, step after step after step, an inevitable doom with a familiar drumming beat. It started two days ago when I was out getting Christmas presents for my parents while they were both out and I had the day off. In our small urban town, there was a small actual town area with things like a grocery store, small banks, library, and bunches of mom and pop shops and restaurants. I had Cherry Bomb by the Runaways playing loudly in my earbuds as I walked along the familiar streets. I had a plan before I even left the house. For my mom, I'm just going to get her a small knickknack from the thrift store. I know she loves those. For my dad, I'll get him a new golfing bag, since his is starting to get some wear and tears on it. And for my brother, drumming sticks and flowers, like every year. I walked through the thrift store, gave the owner a nod, and began to look around for the stuff. The golfing bag was relatively easy. There was a nice one in the corner, which looked as if it was only used a couple of times before the sport was dropped. The knick-knack, on the other hand, was a bit harder. I had to find something my mom didn't already have, which felt impossible. As I picked up a small ceramic turtle statue with a large floppy hat fishing into a pond, my eyes caught the man behind the counter. He was staring straight forward, right past me. I got kind of nervous, but didn't make anything of it, until he started walking. He walked... Slowly, step after step after step, he walked past the counter and out of the door. As he walked, I cautiously followed a few steps behind. I saw through the shop's crowded window, filled to the brim with items, to the outside. Outside, there were people just like him, walking forward. Looking back, I think I would have been better off if I wasn't a curious person. If I was one of those people who just kept themselves safe. People who didn't risk their asses to go see what's up. Sadly, I was not. 
and am still not one of those people. As he walked out and joined the others, I left my safe spot of the Isle of Ceramics and moved out into the open floor and closer to the window. Everyone, they were all walking mindlessly, eyes forward, blank stares, straight posture, step after step. Questions gnawed at my head, hungry for answers, and though fighting it off would have been a smarter plan, I succumbed easily. I cautiously made my way to the glass door with the old open-close flip sign hanging by a thin thread, opening it ever so slightly. When no immediate effects took place as I did, I opened it more. After about half a minute of pushing the door open slightly more and more, I finally summoned up strength to step out. I froze in my steps, waiting for something. Something. Nothing. The people walked forward, merging down one of the smaller streets, faces blank and steps slow. I felt that gnaw again, just on the side of my head. I also felt deep unease begin to wipe over. The two feelings began to fight about what to do. Staying put and hopefully being safe, or walking towards whatever drew the rest of town and possibly putting myself in danger. A rhyme went through my head. Curiosity killed the cat. In an instant, though, the rhyme was finished by the eternal words of my father. But satisfaction brought it back to life. The quote in my mind had made a decision for me. I began to walk forward. I made sure to speed walk with my arms shoved in my pockets. I think I was afraid if I walked like them, I wouldn't be able to stop. After passing a few blocks, the people turned down into a very small street. They shuffled and nudged and made their way down the street mindlessly. I knew where the street led and decided to take a back way. I didn't want to be a part of the flock of sheep led to the slaughter. I turned quickly, ran down a different and empty alleyway behind a diner, and made it to the other side. As I walked, I just then heard the guitar riff and heavy bass in the cover of Bad Romance done by Hailstorm. With all the commotion, I hadn't noticed that my music was still playing. I exited the alleyway and saw the huge center of town, decorated in tinsel, Christmas wreaths, and large holiday signs. What caught my attention more was the large group of people circling and moving around something. Something I couldn't see. Satisfaction brought it back to life. The words repeated in my head as I began to walk around the crowds, seeing what could possibly cause all this. The crowds surrounded something, and the only way I'd be able to see it would be to shove past all of those people. As I rushed my head to think of something... A quick, one-word thought solved my dilemma. Ladder. I looked around and found a short fire escape ladder attached to a small apartment building. I ran over and began to quickly climb up. I made it to the top, caught my breath, turned around, and looked. Everyone was surrounding a small boy. He was wearing a golden robe of some sort, and he held a beautiful drum. I could see he was banging on it with drumsticks. I strained to listen, but realized my music was still playing. Wonderwall, by Oasis. I reached for my headphones to take them off and hear the boy's drum, but as I did, I felt a small hand squeeze my shoulder tightly. I quickly turned and hit the hand away out of instinct. I was met with the horrified gaze of a very small boy with large, noise-canceling headphones. He had blonde curly hair and green eyes with a dark ring around them. They reminded me of my brothers. As I stared, I realized I knew him. My brother went to the same small school with him, and you'd see him holding an adult's hands, sitting off in the distance. He took my hand and squeezed it as tight as he could, causing a sore pain to begin. He looked so scared, on the verge of tears. Noise. It quickly occurred to me, noise must be what makes the people like this. 
I kept my headphones on, and I let the small boy squeeze my hand as I went back to watching the drummer in the crowd. The people became still as they surrounded, listening to his drumming, still with blank expressions and slightly open mouths. I watched and waited. After a few moments, I saw suddenly and abruptly the drumming stop. The boy lifted the drumsticks just above the drum. I began to take off my headphones and let the tune of Drive By, sung by train, slip away. The air was cold with silence. It felt sharp. There wasn't a single noise. Then, screams. Suddenly, everyone in the crowd screamed as loud as they could, and I quickly shuffled and fidgeted for my headphones, trying to find something that would stop the awful screaming. I shoved them back on, but they did nothing. It was still there. I even saw the little boy put his hands over his noise-canceling ones. I shut my eyes and squeezed them tight, waiting for it all to go away, waiting for it to stop. I don't know how long I stayed like that. Paralyzed. Maybe hours? The boy held my hand so tight, but I wasn't going to stop him. At some point, while Hey There Delilah by The Plain White Tees played, I noticed it stopped. There was no more screaming. It must have faded out ever so slowly for me to not notice its disappearance. I gathered whatever I had left in me and shakily looked up. I I don't know what I was expecting. But not this. Down below were bodies. So many bodies. Bodies of people I knew. Bodies stacked and piled like they were nothing but garbage blood and organs stained and scattered the ground, only one spot untouched, a small circle where the little drummer boy played. I looked over at the child. He had his head down, locked between his knees tight, and he was trembling. He still held a tight, painful grip on my hand. He couldn't see this. I took a minute to gather my strength, breathing, As I did, a strong scent of blood hit me and almost sent me over the edge. I regained, reminding myself I needed to help this boy. I needed to. I took one more breath before standing up and picking up the boy in a quick motion and walking inside. I kicked the door open and felt the boy's head lift just as I walked in. I quickly closed the door behind me and set the boy down. Given his merely concerned and anxious facial expression, I assumed he didn't see anything. A front door across the room was open, and I quickly ran over to close it. Just in case. As I did, the boy walked over to the door outside to the landing. I had run over and abruptly stopped him before he could. As I shoved my way in front of him, he began to make whimpers and cries as he tried to shove past me, even resorting to hitting me. After a couple of minutes of this, He attempted to shove me and then ran to the couch and grabbed a pillow to squeeze. With that slightly under control, I needed to figure out where the hell I was. I walked into the apartment's small kitchen and saw children's crudely drawn pictures hanging on the wall. After looking them over, I saw most were signed with the same messy and large handwriting. Sam. Okay, his name was Sam. While looking, I saw one of his drawings had a picture of three stick figure people. The one on the left labeled Mom, the one in the middle labeled Me, and the one on the right labeled Mama. I looked around the kitchen to see if there was a number or anything I could use to tell his parents he was alright. I saw a picture of them, his moms, sitting on the counter. As I did, a cold, wet dread ran over me. They were down there. They heard the drums. I looked back at the little boy who was still holding the pillow between his chest and knees. A guilt and despair washed over me, fully processing the consequences of the... event? Fuck. I forgot my family. 
A slice of cold ran down my spine as I realized the possibilities. My dad, he was at work. He shouldn't be in town. But my mom, she was visiting her friend. She could be out there. She... I had to cut my mind off. If I fell any further down that rabbit hole, I'd break down and I couldn't afford that right now. I had to be the strong one. I decided I had choices. I could stay here and see if someone comes to help and just make sure this boy is okay. I could go back home and see if my parents were okay, try to take the boy with me. I could go down there and see what the hell happened and get answers. Just the mere thought of the last one filled me with an unyielding terror and made me sick just to think about it. All of these different choices gave into different saints and demons of mine. The first gave into my saint of wanting to care and put others above myself. The second gave into my demon of selfishness and risking others to make sure things that I care about are okay. And the last gave into my demon of curiosity. Given that my curiosity demon has only led me to more misfortune, I eliminated it from my choices. I gave another glance over to the child, still squeezing that pillow. I know a smart choice would have been to stay here, but acting as a sitting duck never pleased me, and won't now. I walked over to Sam and bent down, using my caring voice, one I often used on children. Hey Sam, we're gonna have to go. We're gonna have to go help, okay? Sam looked scared and frustrated, and I couldn't blame him. I picked up his noise-canceling headphones off a table and set them next to him on the couch. I then moved to the kitchen and grabbed mine. As I walked back, Sam began to put his on. As he stood up, I reached down to pick him up. He promptly shoved me away as I began to do so, and we both seemed to agree on a simple hand-holding. I cautiously opened the front door and walked out into the cold December air. I knew the way back to home by heart, and I knew a way for Sam and me to walk and not see the main area. I knew these streets, and I've known them my whole life, but I've never known them to be so cold and empty. 20 minutes later of soundless, intense walking, we made it past the gates and into the small neighborhood. Everything here was okay. It was such a quick change. It almost gave me whiplash. People were out gardening, talking, sitting on their front porches. Naive. Ignorant. It almost convinced me everything that happened was some sort of hallucination. Almost. It was too real. And Sam's tight grip reminded me of that. I remembered the screams. So loud. But I was able to bring myself back by forcing myself to mouth the lyrics to Under Pressure by David Bowie. We walked past a few houses, finally making it to mine. I jogged up, still holding Sam's arm, and took out my key. I unlocked the door and walked in, tugging off my headphones as I did. I saw a light in the kitchen and heard my father's familiar voice. Hey, kiddo. How was shopping? I didn't think. I quickly ran down the hallway with Sam still in grasp and ran to see my dad. As I met his eyes, his calm and cool exterior quickly shifted into concern. Hey, what's wrong? Words, story, the harrowing events spilled out in a large jumble, like dumping the letters to a Scrabble game. The people... They, wa- they walked, they walked, they all walked, they, they made a group, they were all blank, they didn't, they didn't know. Hey kiddo, hey, slow down, So He was cut off. Parumpa pum pum. A drumming began. His eyes glazed over. His face slid into a blank expression. His posture straightened. I began to lunge at him, throw him down, and 
take him out of this curse, this spell, this living fucking hell. But I didn't move. I felt my body grow numb as I heard the drumming. I took my headphones off at the door. They were sitting around my neck, just right there. Simultaneously, me and my father's feet began to move. Step after step after step after step. The worst part is I knew what I was doing, but I couldn't do anything. Step after step after step after step. Not rushed, not fast. Agonizingly slow. Step after step after step. An inevitable doom with a familiar drumming beat. I felt Sam still gripping my hand as I walked out of the doorway. I wanted to yell at him to run. I wanted to shove him away from me. I tried. As he saw the other groups of people walking, I saw him try to pull me back, but I kept walking. He tried again before finally letting go. He ran up to me, shoving me back and shaking me. I saw he was yelling, but I couldn't hear it. All I could hear was the pound of the drums. Pa-rum-pa-pum-pum. He fell to the floor after I wouldn't stop walking, and his efforts became useless. He broke down. I saw him put his head between his knees again, and I wanted nothing more than to squirm out of this hellish trance and hold him, comfort him, get away, anything. But I kept on walking. I walked. A tormenting couple of minutes later, I saw the crowd begin to stop and surround. If I could cry, Tears would be filling my eyes and my fists would be clenched. We all walked until finally we joined together, surrounding the small drummer boy. I couldn't see him, but I heard him play. It was the only thing I could hear. Pa-rum-pa-pum-pum. Then, the drumming stopped. I wanted to scream. I wanted to run. I wanted to close my eyes and never open them again until it was over. But I just stood there. The crowd then began to shuffle. It was moving away. It was moving away from me. As it did, I clearly saw the drummer boy in front of me. A knife cut through my heart. I saw the drummer boy's face. It was him. It was Lucas. It was my brother. He was alive. I noticed the only two left standing to face him were myself and my dad. Lucas looked at us with cold eyes. As I stared in disbelief, his gaze felt unfamiliar, one I've never seen him wear. He seemed... Wrong. This wasn't my Lucas. He continued to stare, even with his unwelcoming gaze. I wanted to hug him. I wanted to hold him in the tightest embrace I could. But I couldn't. I couldn't fucking move. All at once, in such a quick motion, Lucas was no longer staring at us. As I looked at him, He opened his mouth, almost like he was going to say something. But then, it kept opening, and opening, and opening, and out of Lucas's skin crawled a shriveled but tall, demonic being. Lucas wasn't alive. What was, was it? 
It was gray and thin, like bone, and you could hear the snap of its bones as it moved and shaped its form. Its head was much too large for its body, and as it looked up, I was met with the most familiar of eyes on the most monstrous of creatures. It was Lucas's eyes, just in the sockets of this creature. It put my every nerve on edge. It wasn't right. It was so, so wrong. As I began to feel every sense of the word dread in me, it grinned. It grinned with a mouth much too wide for its face. A mouth filled with sharp teeth. A mouth filled with overflowing drool. A mouth stained with blood. It lunged at me, and without warning, every emotion I've ever felt hit me at once, crashing into me as well as the monstrous beast. I felt tears begin to flood my eyes as the creature pinned me to the ground. I grabbed its arm in a useless attempt to escape. The thing looked down on me, mouth wide with a smile and drooling, and with Lucas's beautiful eyes, it then used its hand to swipe at my neck, and I felt a hot rush of pain flood there as it cut my throat. It then lunged its head and bit my neck in the place that it had cut. The pain was agonizing and I tried to scream and cry, but I couldn't. I squirmed and kicked to no avail. I looked to see if anybody would help me, but everyone's mouths were wide open. They were screaming. I couldn't hear it, but I saw. As pain filled my body, my head rushed, and it reminded me how I got here. Two years ago, my brother was found in the streets one night, after his throat had been slit open and his vocal cords pulled out. Lucas liked to sit on the street corner around holiday time to sing and play his drum. We called him our little drummer boy. He loved playing the drums. As my thoughts rushed, I couldn't hear anything. Nothing except a soft, repeating, and remorseful Parumpa pum pum. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factors 2-Minute Meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factors no prep, no mess meals, free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, They also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. 
This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code SCAREYOU2SLEEP50 at factormeals.com. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Our next story is actually a poem that was first published by Robert W. Service in the book of poetry titled Songs of a Sourdough in 1907, and it's called The Cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home in the south to roam, Round the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. Though he'd often say, in his homely way, that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the parka's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd close, then the lashes froze. Till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed and the stars o'erhead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and Cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a sort of moan, It's the cursed cold, and it's got right hold, till I'm chilled clean through to the bone. Yet taint been dead, it's my awful dread, of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear, foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. A pal's last need is a thing to heed, so I swore I would not fail. And we started on the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh, and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death, and I hurried horror-driven, 
with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, You may tax your brawn and brains, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies round in a ring, howled out their woes to the homeless snows, Oh God, how I loathe the thing. And every day that quiet clay seemed a heavy and heavier grow, and on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad, and I felt half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Till I came to the marge of Lake Labarge, and a derelict there lay. It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice, it was called the Alice May. And I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum. Then here, said I with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared and the furnace roared, such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak was streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear. But the stars came out, and they danced about, ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked, and it's time I looked. Then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm, in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile, you could see a mile, and he said, please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge. I cremated Sam McGee. This next story was written in 1868 by a not well-known-enough writer named Ada Boisson. I absolutely adore this story, and I hope you will as well. This is The Ghost's Summons. Wanted, sir, a patient. It was in the early days of my professional career, when patients were scarce and fees scarcer, and though I was in the act of sitting down to my chop, and had promised myself a glass of steaming punch afterwards, in the honor of the Christmas season, I hurried instantly into my surgery. I entered briskly, but no sooner did I catch sight of the figure standing leaning against the counter than I started back with a strange feeling of horror, which, for the life of me, I could not comprehend. Never shall I forget the ghastliness of that face, the white horror stamped upon every feature, the agony which seemed to sink the very eyes beneath the contracted brows. It was awful to me to behold, accustomed as I was to scenes of terror. You seek advice? I began with some hesitation. No, I am not ill. 
You require then... Hush, he interrupted, approaching more nearly and dropping his already low murmur to a mere whisper. I believe you are not rich. Would you be willing to earn a thousand pounds? A thousand pounds? His words seemed to burn my very ears. I should be thankful if I could do so honestly, I replied with dignity. What is the service required of me? A peculiar look of intense horror passed over the white face before me, but the blue-black lips answered firmly. To attend a deathbed. A thousand pounds to attend a deathbed? Where am I to go, then? Whose is it? Mine. The voice in which this was said sounded so hollow and distant that involuntarily I shrank back. Yours? What nonsense, you are not a dying man. You are pale, but... You appear perfectly healthy. <laughs> you hush, he interrupted. I know all this. You cannot be more convinced of my physical health than I am myself. Yet I know that before the clock tolls the first hour after midnight, I shall be a dead man. But, he shuddered slightly, but stretching out his hand commandingly, motioned me to be silent. I am but too well informed of what I affirm, he said quietly. I have received a mysterious summons from the dead. No mortal aid can avail me. I am as doomed as the wretch on whom the judge has passed sentence. I do not come either to seek your advice or to argue the matter with you, but simply to buy your services. I offer you a thousand pounds to pass the night in my chamber and witness the scene which takes place. The sum may appear to you extravagant, but I have no further need to count the cost of any gratification, and the spectacle you will have to witness is no common sight of horror. The words, strange as they were, were spoken calmly enough, but as the last sentence dropped slowly from the livid lips, an expression of such wild horror again passed over the stranger's face that, in spite of the immense fee, I hesitated to answer. You fear to trust the promise of a dead man. See here and be convinced. He exclaimed eagerly, and the next instant, on the counter between us, lay a parchment document, and following the indication of that white, muscular hand, I read the words, And to Mr. Frederick Keed, of 14 High Street, Alton, I bequeath the sum of one thousand pounds for certain services rendered to me. I have had that will drawn up within the last 24 hours, and I signed it an hour ago, in the presence of competent witnesses. I am prepared, you see. Now, do you accept my offer, or not? My answer was to walk across the room, and take down my hat, and then lock the door of the surgery, communicating with the house. It was a dark, icy cold night, and somehow the courage and determination which the sight of my own name in connection with a thousand pounds had given me flagged considerably as I found myself hurried along through the silent darkness by a man whose deathbed I was about to attend. He was grimly silent, but as his hand touched mine, in spite of the frost, it felt like a burning coal. On we went, tramp, tramp through the snow, on and on till even I grew weary, and at length, on my appalled ear, struck the chimes of a church clock, whilst close at hand, 
I distinguish the snowy hillocks of a churchyard. Heavens, was this awful scene of which I was to be witness to take place veritably among the dead? Eleven, groaned the doomed man. Gracious God, but two more hours and the ghostly messenger will bring the summons. Come, come, for mercy's sake, let us hasten. There was but a short road separating us now from a wall which surrounded a large mansion, and along this we hastened until we reached a small door. Passing through this, in a few minutes we were stealthily ascending the private staircase to a splendidly furnished apartment, which left no doubt of the wealth of its owner. All was intensely silent, however, through the house, and about this room in particular, there was a stillness that, as I gazed around, struck me as almost ghastly. My companion glanced at the clock on the mantel shelf and sunk into a large chair by the side of the fire with a shudder. Only an hour and a half longer, he muttered. Great heaven, I thought I had more fortitude. This horror unmans me. Then, in a fiercer tone, and clutching my arm, he added, <laughs> You mock me. You think me mad. But wait till you see. Wait till you see. I put my hand on his wrist, for there was now a fever in his sunken eyes which checked the superstitious chill which had been gathering over me, and made me hope that, after all, my first suspicion was correct, and that my patient was but the victim of some fearful hallucination. Mock you, I answered soothingly. Far from it, I sympathize intensely with you and would do much to aid you. You require sleep. Lie down and leave me to watch. He groaned, but rose, and began throwing off his clothes, and watching my opportunity, I slipped a sleeping powder, which I had managed to put in my pocket before leaving the surgery, into the tumbler of claret that stood beside him. The more I saw, the more I felt convinced that it was the nervous system of my patient which required my attention, and it was with sincere satisfaction I saw him drink the wine, and then stretch himself on the luxurious bed. Ha! Huh, thought I as the clock struck twelve, and instead of a groan, the deep breathing of the sleeper sounded throughout the room. You won't receive any summons tonight, and I may make myself comfortable. Noiselessly, therefore, I replenished the fire, poured myself a large glass of wine, and, drawing the curtain so that the firelight should not disturb the sleeper, I put myself in a position to follow his example. How long I slept, I know not, but suddenly, I aroused with a start, and as ghostly a thrill of horror as ever I remember to have felt in my life. Something what I knew not seemed near something nameless but unutterably awful I gazed around the fire emitted a faint blue glow just sufficient to enable me to see that the room was exactly the same as when I fell asleep but that the long hand of the clock wanted but five minutes of the mysterious hour, which was to be the death moment of the summoned man. Was there anything in it then? Any truth in the strange story he had told? The silence was intense. I could not even hear a breath from the bed, and as I was about to rise and approach, when again that awful horror seized me, and at the same moment, my eye fell upon the mirror opposite the door. And I saw, great heaven, that awful shape, that ghastly mockery of what had been humanity. Was it really a messenger from the buried, quiet dead? It stood there in visible death clothes, 
but the awful face was ghastly with corruption, and the sunken eyes gleamed forth a green, glassy glare which seemed a veritable blast from the infernal fires below. To move or utter a sound in that hideous presence was impossible, and, like a statue, I sat and saw that horrid shape move slowly towards the bed. What was the awful scene enacted there, I know not. I heard nothing except a low, stifled, agonized groan, and I saw the shadow of that ghastly messenger bending over the bed. Whether it was some dreadful but wordless sentence, its breathless lips conveyed as it stood there. I know not, but for an instant, the shadow of a claw-like hand from which the third finger was missing, appeared extended over the doomed man's head. And then, as the clock struck one clear silvery stroke, it fell, and a wild shriek rang throughout the room. A death shriek. I am not given to fainting, but I certainly confess that the next ten minutes of my existence was a cold blank, and even when I did manage to stagger to my feet, I gazed round, vainly endeavoring to understand the chilly horror which still possessed me. Thank God, the room was rid of that awful presence. I saw that. So, gulping down some wine, I lighted a wax taper and staggered towards the bed. Ah, oh, how I prayed that, after all, I might have been dreaming and that my own excited imagination had conjured up some hideous memory of the dissecting room. But one glance was sufficient to answer that. No, the summons had indeed been given and answered. I flashed the light over the dead face, swollen, convulsed still with the death agony, but suddenly... I shrank back. Even as I gazed, the expression of the face seemed to change. The blackness faded into a deathly whiteness. The convulsed features relaxed, and even as if the victim of that dread apparition still lived, a sad, solemn smile stole over the pale lips. I was intensely horrified but still I retained sufficient self-consciousness to be struck professionally by such a phenomenon. Surely there was something more than supernatural agency in all this. Again, I scrutinized the dead face, and even the throat and chest, but with the exception of a tiny pimple on one temple beneath a cluster of hair, not a mark appeared. To look at the corpse one would have believed that this man had indeed died by the visitation of God, peacefully, whilst sleeping. How long I stood there I know not, but time enough to gather my scattered senses and to reflect that, all things considered, my own position would be very unpleasant if I was found thus unexpectedly in the room of the mysteriously dead man. So... As noiselessly as I could, I made my way out of the house. No one met me on the private staircase. The little door opening into the road was easily unfastened, and thankful indeed was I to feel again the fresh, wintry air as I hurried along the road by the churchyard. There was a magnificent funeral soon in that church, and it was said that the young widow of the buried man was inconsolable. And then rumors got abroad of a horrible apparition which had been seen on the night of the death. And it was whispered the young widow was terrified and insisted upon leaving her splendid mansion. I was too mystified with the whole affair to risk my reputation by saying what I knew. And I should have allowed my share in it to remain forever buried in oblivion. Had I not suddenly heard that the widow, objecting to many of the legacies in the last will of her husband, intended to dispute it 
on the score of insanity. And then there gradually arose the rumor of his belief in having received a mysterious summons. On this, I went to the lawyer and sent a message to the lady that, as the last person who had attended her husband, I undertook to prove his sanity, and I besought her to grant me an interview in which I would relate as strange and horrible a story as ear had ever heard. The same evening, I received an invitation to go to the mansion. I was ushered immediately into a splendid room, and there, standing before the fire, was the most dazzlingly beautiful young creature I had ever seen. She was very small, but exquisitely made. Had it not been for the dignity of her carriage, I should have believed her a mere child. With a stately bow, she advanced, but did not speak. I come on a strange and painful errand, I began, and then I started, for I happened to glance full into her eyes, and from them down to the small right hand grasping the chair. The wedding ring was on that hand. I conclude that you are the Mr. Keed who requested permission to tell me some absurd ghost story and whom my late husband mentioned here. And as she spoke, she stretched out her left hand towards something. But what I knew not, for my eyes were fixed on that hand. Horror! White and delicate it might be, but it was shaped like a claw, and the third finger was missing. One sentence was enough after that. Madam, all I can tell you is that the ghost who summoned your husband was marked by a singular deformity. The third finger of the left hand was missing, I said sternly, and the next instant I had left that beautiful sinful presence. That will was never disputed. The next morning, too, I received a check for a thousand pounds, and the next news I heard of the widow was that she herself had seen the awful apparition and had left the mansion immediately. the last little bit tonight, I realized I didn't mean to, but all night I've slowly been taking you back in time, from modern day to 1907 to 1868, and now to this poem from the 16th century. Originally published in French, this disturbing little poem is sure to wickedly delight you. Here is The Legend of Saint Nicholas Three little children sought the plain Gleaners of the golden grain, they lingered past the angel song, and dewy shadows swept along. Mid the silence of the wood, the butcher's lonely cottage stood. Butcher, lodge us for the night, lodge us till the morning light. Enter in, ye children small, I can find a place for all. The butcher seized a knife straightway, and did the little creature slay. He put them in a tub of brine, in pieces small as they were swine. St. Nicholas, at seven years' end, his way did to the forest wind. He sought the butcher's cottage drear. Butcher, I would rest me here. Enter, enter, St. Nicholas. You are welcome, St. Nicholas. Enter, enter, St. Nicholas. There is place for you the night to pass. Scarce had the saint his entrance made. He would the supper board was laid. Will you have of ham a slice? I will not, for it is not nice. Of this veal you'll take a bit? No, I do not relish it. 
Give me of the little swine, for seven long years you have laid in brine. The butcher caught the words he said, and forthwith from the porter fled. Butcher, butcher, do not flee. Repent, and God will pardon thee. St. Nicholas, the tub drew near, and lo, he placed three fingers there. The first one said, I sweetly rest. The second said, I too am blessed. The third replied, "'Tis well with me, in paradise I seem to be." Thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed all of these holiday stories. I enjoyed recording and editing them because they were fun. Uh, Thanks so much to all of the feedback I've been getting. The incredible feedback I've been getting from last week's story, uh, God Will Provide. I'm blown away. I, I've never seen so much interaction on the show, to be honest, in on the, all the different social medias. I've been getting emails about it, asking about, you know, the background of the story and this and that. And you've all been so encouraging. And I really should put my work on the show more often because it's such a great feeling to have all of this thank you so much and welcome to all of my new listeners i know that i picked up quite a few in the past week thanks to spotify and i've never advertised my show before and so seeing the difference is incredible i welcome i'm so glad you all found it and i'm so glad you liked will god provide or god will provide wow don't know the name of the my own story that i wrote um anyway I have some cornbread waiting for me in my kitchen, cooling on my cutting board, and it is calling my name, and it's a nice chilly night, and I hope you're all having a nice cozy night inside, and for those of you who listen to me at work, I hope tonight is an easygoing night for you, Um, or day. Some of you listen to me during the day too, I think. Anyway, uh, you can follow the show on Twitter, Tumblr, Reddit, and Instagram, um, and go join the Facebook group where uh, we actually have three new mods to help with all of you amazing newcomers. I'm so happy to see you all. So go say hi to the three new mods. I put I pinned a post with them in it. Say hi to them. They're great. All right, I think that's it. Go get some sleep and sweet dreams. <laughs>